Access to Democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center and medispa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. With service built around courtesy, dignity, and respect, Mayo-trained Dr. Charles Crutchfield personally treats each patient and is acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. True Stone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served as members since 1939. True Stone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. True Stone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Edina Eye Physicians and Surgeons, a division of Twin Cities Eye Consultants, has proudly served the Twin Cities for more than 55 years now in seven convenient locations. Using the most advanced technology combined with human touch, Edina Eye offers comprehensive services and dedicated specialists committed to excellence with innovative procedures and expertise for the most advanced eye care. Welcome to this episode of Access to Democracy. I'm Steve Francisco. We're pleased to have you with us today. It's my pleasure to welcome to our studio today a new guest. Uh, Minnesota has one of the largest percentages per capita of Muslim Americans of any state in the country. And uh, today it's my pleasure to welcome Jaylani Hussein, who is the Executive Director of the Council on American Islamic Relations in Minnesota, also known as CARE Minnesota. Uh, welcome to Access to Democracy, Jaylani. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. So tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into some more substantive questions. Uh, where did you come from? How did you end up in Minnesota? That's a great question that uh, uh, I get to answer a lot of times. I enjoy answering it. And so, you know, my, uh, I'm originally from Somalia. Um, and um, born there uh, in, in northern Somalia and uh, left there in 1990 uh, when the civil war in Somalia occurred mm -hmm. uh, as a young child and uh, eventually hopped around between Egypt and Kenya and eventually came to the United States um, and uh, as a refugee and uh, Minnesota was an option. We had a relative, a distant relative who was here, uh, who came as an international student, uh, exchange student in the mid 70s. And so Minnesota was on our map. Also Atlanta was on our map. And so mm. we chose Minnesota. And I remember in Egypt, I always tell the story that, um, you know, uh, when we decided that we're coming to Minnesota, I looked at the map. And I was like, man, Minnesota's uh, <laughs> further away from the equator. <laughs> Almost so I, up to Canada. Exactly. So I knew it was going to be cold. And I remember joking with my mom that Minnesota is like our freezer. So I would open the freezer in <laughs> Egypt and stick my head in there and be like, this is what Minnesota is. To and acclimate yourself exactly. to and your future home. And you still came. We came. And we actually came on February 16, 1993. Very cold, very typical Minnesota day. And... Uh, Man, I don't think we—I don't think we were prepared. Um, just, just dealing with the weather. I, I remember it was cold in the baggage mm -hmm. uh, area. We were already inside the building, but it was cold. Um, and then you went outside, and I don't think I had the proper jackets for Minnesota winter. I've often thought it must be quite a shock to immigrants and refugees who come to our state from different parts of the world. Certainly from Africa, right. from Somalia. But also, we have a large Hmong community, Correct. people from Southeast Asia, also right. a very warm climate. Right. And I often think what a shock it must be to them when they experience their first Minnesota winter. Oh, it is. I think it's a shock to anybody who's experienced this, even, you know, even Americans who come from other parts of the country, right. southern part. For us, I think, you know, just the fact that, you know, it, you know, it can get cold in other parts of the world, but to be consistently cold for six months or even longer. Right. Um, and even now, I would say, many Minnesotans would say, we don't have the 90s winters that we did. Right. Um, and so coming from 19, to Minnesota into 1993, there wasn't really a large number of Somali immigrants here. Right. Uh, so we were among the earliest wave of refugees from Somalia. And 
um, we kind of uh, were the guinea pigs before the rest of Somali immigrants joined us here in Minnesota. And Jay Lani, obviously you didn't come to Minnesota for the weather. You came with hopes for a better life yeah. for you and your family. Um, has Minnesota lived up to its promise, what you hoped it would be? I think to a, to a larger extent, uh, yes. Um, and to some extent, I think probably for other Minnesotans, maybe not. Um, I would say for, for the larger extent, I think Minnesota is a very welcoming state uh, for immigrants. I think um, we uh, do a good job of being nice to each other and welcoming each other. And, and I, my experience obviously is unique to me. Uh, I remember I was very fortunate to have this amazing uh, elementary school teacher named Ms. Jo, Love, Ms. jo Livgard, who was someone who was part of that experience of just you know being welcomed and feeling Took comfortable you under her wing and she was a you know a, a ex extremely bright teacher you know mm -hmm. one of those few teachers who, who had the opportunity to travel the world and experience different cultures so for her having you know immigrant students from from Laos and Vietnam and from Somalia for her it was something that she leaned into and right. um, it's it's the experiences of those unique individuals it's the you know, uh, uh, the church that, the Lutheran church that welcomed my family and brought. Lutheran Social Services. Yes, LSS helped, actually resettled us and so. Right. There are many of uh, the that. religious groups here, the Catholic Church, other yep. religious denominations, yep. the American Refugee Committee right. that was right. set up here in Minneapolis in mm -hmm. the 1970s to yep. help welcome Southeast Asian refugees. Right. So we've sort of had this reputation as a welcoming place for refugees right, right. but like any place i suppose we don't always fully live up to our promises no no and we don't there are problems right. in the community from time to time too right, right. no I, and i think the for immigrants it's really uh... you know the first six months might be a little bit you get support but mm -hmm. i you know even now i think it's much worse but um, after that you really have to sink and swim and um, you know i think I remember my father uh, did not realize that, uh, you know, being on welfare or taking government subsidies was uh, uh, actual resource to the community. He, we, we t he took it from the wrong angle that he thought that we had to pay back that money. So yeah. we were not on welfare shortly because we were all get out and work. And remember my brother's going to work, my mom going to work. Uh, and so that propelled us into just fighting. But I would mm -hmm. say, you know, the challenges that we see today with a lot of the immigrant children and, 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 and the challenges that exist are really challenges that existed in this country for far too long. Mm -hmm. And I think Minnesota is part of that uh, manifestation. Of you that. are the executive director of CARE Minnesota, uh, the, again, the Council on American Islamic Relations, which is a national organization, mm -hmm. and you're the head of its Minnesota chapter since? Yes, yeah, since I've been in there since 2015. Tell us a little bit about CARE. What is your mission? So CARE is really, as you mentioned, it's a, we're like the ACLU. We have our state chapters indi individually run, uh, independent, but part of this larger framework of a national organization. Uh, and our mission is really uh, focused on empowering the American Muslim community. Uh, we want to be an organization that promotes uh, justice um, and promotes a mutual understanding of Islam and Muslims, which we know is a, a, a major reason why uh, discrimination against Muslims occurs. And really care is there because of the constant need from the Muslim community, whether here in Minnesota or across, to just really live out their faith uh, in America um, and continuing the unfortunate reality of the fight uh, for religious intolerance, uh, against religious intolerance in America. It seems like the work that CARE does and other civil rights groups, it's really a very American thing to do because the people that came, as you yourself, came from Somalia or other people who have come from right. other places in Africa or Southeast Asia or Latin America, they come to this country to pursue the American dream. Right. They, they want things that are not that different from any other American, right? Abs absolutely. And so it's not an organization looking for special privileges. It's, looking, it's an organization looking to get Americans to live up to their highest ideals about what this country is. Absolutely. And, and to that point, you know, it's, it's to, to make sure the Constitution works for all of us, not just some of us. Right. And one of the biggest challenges that we face is around religious discrimination in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And we get people sometimes who would say, well, you know, they're asking 
to pray at work and we're not allowed to pray. No, <laughs> most likely, you know, uh, Muslims are the ones always asking for this, but this is a right that has been ingrained in our Constitution. The courts have said for, that absolutely. employers have to make reasonable accommodations yep, for yep. people to practice their right. religious faith, and not just if they're Muslim, right. if they're any other faith too, absolutely. right? Absolutely, absolutely. So. And, and, and so we, we fight to make sure that civil rights for Muslims and other minorities are actually true to the letter of the law. Mm -hmm. But also we fight to win the hearts and minds of people who uh, through fear and political fear and among other things are oftentimes uh, that ignorance and that fear drives a sense of an acceptable uh, discrimination. And we run into this term Islamophobia. Yep. This uh, a phobia being an unreasonable fear of people that you maybe don't know. Right or right. don't have friends who are Muslim, or you don't know that they're Muslim, right. Right. Uh, which takes many different forms in terms of discrimination in the mm -hmm. workplace, discrimination in housing, right. in job offers, right. other types of things. Um, sadly, we live in a time when we're seeing a surge in hate crimes Correct. in the United States. Mm -hmm. Minnesota is not exempt from this, sadly. Uh, we saw the incident that happened at the Dar al Farouk Islamic Center attack in 2017. This was masterminded by a group of men who came up here from Illinois. They weren't even from Minnesota. They were convicted and sentenced to 53 years uh, in prison. The leader of this anti-Muslim terrorist group known as the White Rabbits, mm -hmm. um, no one was killed or injured but that doesn't mean people weren't injured. They were injured psychologically, weren't they, from this this attack oh, that happened? Absolutely, and 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 you know, the, there was an actual imam who was sleeping in the the room right next to it. So if they threw the bomb in his room, he would have definitely been uh, seriously injured. So uh, you know, this attack actually is a is a great example to showcase how hate moves in in our state, um, and it actually started with a local group in Bloomington hmm. uh, against the mosque. Very, sounds very friendly group. Uh, it's actually, they're called the Friends of Smith Park. And it's literally a, a one woman organization. But when they talk and when you see the media sometimes write, they may write citizens or group of people are upset. But it's actually just one woman. Isn't this something that <laughs> happens too frequently where you get these groups that are actually hate groups, that hate particular races right. or religious groups, but they use an innocuous name, yes. like the Friends of Smith, Smith Park. Park. Right, and there's a park that's adjacent to the mosque. And so uh, this woman has been going to the city council and also writing about the mosque, writing things about the mosque. And, uh, and in addition to that, the, her writings were actually picked up by the national network of hate groups. And we believe that is one of the reasons why, as, as the court information was being shared in this trial, it's that type of information that galvanized this community of, uh, of haters to target this mosque. It was not, they just couldn't identify it out of the thousand mosques that we have in the country for Muslims. Mm -hmm. They literally had to have that local group spewing hate, then the national group attaching to it, and then here comes the most dangerous of the, mm -hmm. of the groups, which are these militia, these men who are sometimes well-trained, as this guy was a deputy sheriff uh, and, and had experience being trained. and so. Uh, you have someone like that using information that's being ground, pulled in the ground and then it comes and attacks a mosque. Jay Lani, does CARE work with other groups in our community, other religious groups to confront this type of racial bigotry? We recently had on Ethan Roberts right. from the Jewish Community Relations mm -hmm. Council, mm -hmm. the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, mm -hmm. other religious groups. Do you work with them as absolutely, well to absolutely. expose we, these types of hate ab organizations? Absolutely, we work across, uh, and that's part of our mission, is to build coalitions that promote justice and mutual understanding. And so we work in coalition. We're part of a, uh, a statewide anti-hate group right now uh, mm -hmm. that is trying to pass legislation in the state of Minnesota uh, to make sure that law enforcement are properly documenting, that the state is also properly documenting hate crimes, and there are support for communities that are working to address this issue. So um, we are working with all of our uh, interfaith partners and we only can be able to address this issue in a community effort. The Muslim community cannot stop Islamophobia or anti-Muslim sentiment. It really is the larger, broader community that has to do that. 
When research is done about these hate organizations and people who are drawn to them, <clears throat> don't we often find that it's really based out of fear, ignorance, not knowing other people, not being able to empathize with people who are different. But you know, in one sense, this is not a new story in our country. It's not. This is not new. It goes back, you can look back in American history to the 1850s when there were signs in New York, Irish need not apply. Right. Right. Later discrimination after the wave of Eastern European right. immigration, Italian immigration. Right. All of these groups faced discrimination when they came to our country Absolutely. from different people. Absolutely. And so it seems like some of this uh, animosity directed toward Muslims and Southeast Asian immigrants and refugees is actually a continuation of a very old story. Absolutely. And I, I'll tell, share with you a story. I was in St. Cloud speaking at an event and a gentleman came up to me and he said, you know, I have a question for you. And I said, sir, let me, give, let me go through my presentation yeah. one, and then we'll have questions at the end. And then he never asked a question. So I actually reached out to him after the event and said, did you, did you have your question answered or did you? And he said, actually, your presentation answered it. Uh, and then I said, well, how? And he specifically spoke to this issue. He said, you know, he was uh, uh, an Irish Catholic mm -hmm. and he remembers uh, how his father uh, was sitting at the dinner table and did not know how horrible the anti-Catholic uh, sentiment existed because his colleagues never really shared that until John F. Kennedy ran for president. And was elected. And was elected. Right. And then he also saw how people gravitated toward John Kennedy after right. um, he was assassinated. Pe um, people form their impressions of people that they may not know from the media. And I think this gets, brings us to a really important question. Mm -hmm. Is the media in Minnesota fair, in your opinion, in the way it portrays Muslim people? And if not, how can that be improved upon? So that's another area that we work in. We work into, as part of our core mission, to make sure that the local media are trained, the local media are engaged. Uh, we also want diversity in the staffing that work in there, in the, in the local media. Um, this is a, goes back to that earlier point you just found. One of the reasons why anti-Catholic existed is because the media portrayed Catholics as to take over America. Right. Uh, in fact, today the Pope you, was going exact, to be running America. Exactly, yeah. and so uh, the media have a, a major role because they continue to shape the narrative of, especially the unknown. The known commodity. It's hard for the media to 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 reshape it. But the unknown commodity, the, the, what the people know less about, what the people are maybe afraid about, if the media doesn't do a good job of providing a very balanced explanation of what's going on, they are part of the problem. And so in Minnesota, I would say the media is probably as bad as everywhere in the country, perhaps even worse. Um, and, and in fact, we just did a research on the Star Tribune that we will be sharing to the public soon once we complete our conversations with the Star Tribune. Uh, but it's not good. The data shows that uh, the coverage of for the last 20, 20 plus years that the Star Tribune and other papers have historically pointed out and only reference Islam or Muslims in a negative light. Um, related to 9-11, related to terrorism. Exactly. And, and, and many other topics where, again, right. the identifier uh, is not uh, important to identify his religion, but by identifying his religion, now you're blanketing. Right. And a then, whole group of people exactly. being collectively exactly. viewed as responsible exactly. for something that happened. We are seeing irrational. we are seeing some change in how that coverage happens. So if some and usually what we, what we asked for, it's nothing different. We just said, can you just report the way you report about other communities? Right. If someone steals a Snickers bar from a gas station. We don't hear a Catholic priest, no, a Catholic member of St. Mary's in Bloomington stole a Snickers bar. Right. What we hear is a man in Bloomington stole a Snickers bar. Right. That's the, the headline. Unfortunately, when it comes to Muslims, they include their religion, they include that identity. And or that, Somali right. or whatever. Exactly. Right. And that takes a, a, an average reader uh, to come into the conclusion, whether they make that intentional conclusion or whether it becomes an implicit bias. And sometimes, regrettably, we've had public officials, and I'm talking right up to the highest office in yes. the land, we yes. had a president not long ago who called for a total ban on Muslims coming into the United States, not based on 
whether the individual had committed a crime or right. was otherwise legally excludable, right. Right. but because of who he or she was, because right. of their religion. Right. I can't think of anything more un-American than that. Absolutely. And, and, and what he drew upon, what President Trump drew upon, was before uh, President Trump came into office, the eight years of President Obama, the drums of the hate movement in this country were beating hard. President Obama and his administration ignored what we saw, which was a, a movement, particularly white supremacy, hate movements across this country, who started to speak about President Obama as being a Muslim, as a threat to America. And so their We've energy... We've seen the same type of rhetoric, by the way, directed against Congresswoman Ilhan Omar correct, of correct. Minneapolis, yes. who, while any of us may not always agree with her political expressions, to attack her based on oh, her she gets, religion. She gets death threats all the time, her and family. And the Attorney and, General of Minnesota, Keith Ellison. Yes. We have one of the highest elected mm -hmm. officials in our state is a Muslim American. Mm -hmm. But these and types the first of things Muslim congressman, yeah. are so reprehensible, I think, to most people. And yet, uh, you know, when we have public officials who push that, I remember President Trump famously questioning where President Obama was from. <laughs> Correct. Whether he was born in the United States. Turns out, of course, he was, right. as he said, born right. in Hawaii, right. as was I, right. which is a part of the United States. Correct. And, and, but, but you have to understand the, the, the polarization in our nation is so deep and was becoming deeper, especially now since the election of Obama. I think, mm -hmm. I think that administration really should be held accountable for not really forcing Americans to have that con dinner, dinner table conversation about race in a meaningful way and not celebrating the identity and this election of President Obama as a way for us to move forward. And right. that really gave birth to what we saw, which was the, the, the Trump years um, and now, post-Trump years, and so, you know, my organization and the work that we do, the, the one thing that I would encourage people who are watching today is we're not going to get out of this, this situation where Americans are not talking to each other about the things that matter the most because they sit on two sides of political spectrum. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to engage people on the opposite side, and we have and that's to listen not just to each on other. The right, that we're talking Both. about people in the left and Both. in the middle too. Absolutely, because yeah. because the reality is, politics of fear exists on both sides. Right. I just heard it this last week, uh, just the way people have been talking about different things and what's happening with Ukraine and everything else. And so, right. uh, you know, I think too many people have oversimplified very complex issues on mm -hmm. everything, and we've taken sides, and that creates a very uh, a toxic situation, but also very dangerous situations for all us Americans because the, Russia is not going to attack the United States with a nuclear bomb. I don't think so. I we think hope the, not. No. I think their attack is going to be to divide us yeah. so that we turn on each other yeah. as Americans. You know, it seems as if in our country historically we've taken two steps forward and often one step back. Today is a good day in terms of moving forward. The President of the United States announced the nomination of okay. the first African-American woman to be a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. And she will go through her confirmation hearings and uh, hopefully they will be fair and they will render a decision to confirm her mm -hmm. as a justice on the highest court in the land. And uh, you think what a remarkable moment this is but uh, again, you know, uh, we talked earlier about some of the extreme radical right views. Those right. views aren't disappearing, no. but they have to be exposed and put in, the, in bright daylight for everyone to see so that people can weigh the merits of what they're saying and Absolute, how dangerous abs that absolutely, rhetoric absolutely. is. Absolutely, because now we are in a social media world. People are no longer communicating the way they used to. Right. We are uh, too tribal and sectarian when it comes to our political ideas. We are afraid to be shared a story about our lives and what's happening. Uh, most Americans, I personally believe, wake up every single morning hoping that their children can have a better life than they did. That's right. They're hoping that they're, they can have a job, they can have a decent pay, their health care can be taken care of. This is what all Americans care about, yet. It's the same thing they care about, and it doesn't matter if you came from Somalia. Oh from no. El Salvador or Mexico, from Southeast Asia, 
that you want your children Absolutely. to do better than you do. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. the essence of what the American dream is, isn't Absolutely. it? And I, and, and I, and I am, I'm saddened to learn that, you know, I had a conversation in Bemidji uh, with an older gentleman, and we, we mm -hmm. talked for a little bit, and, you know, he, he had some anti... He didn't know. He just was in the dark, and after our conversation, you know, that's what struck. That was the, 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 the aha moment where he realized well, they just want the same thing. He, he, he was asking why we, you know, we have Somalis uh, or e immigrants in St. Cloud. I said, because there's jobs there. Right. And I told them, you know, there are probably more East African immigrants in Pelican Rapid than the majority of the Arrowhead. That's in, the <laughs> tendency is to think that Muslim Americans are centered in the Twin Cities, but yeah. actually in our state, they're in communities all over Minnesota. If you go to some places like Wilmer, you would be surprised to right. go into a small rural downtown to find a large percentage of the downtown business owners are Latino and Somali. You can go to Fairbolt, Minnesota and see the same thing. You can go to Moorhead and see communities of color in places. Uh, and so, you know, I just encourage people, we need to get into dialogue. Get we to need know to, each we other. We need to get to know each other. And right. we need to carry the burden of not letting history repeat. So CARE does civic engagement work. I see we're down to our last two yep. minutes. Real quickly, describe your civic engagement work. You do voter registration, encouraging Muslim Minnesotans to get registered to vote. Yeah, absolutely. We And we are proud of our community, particularly the East African immigrant community, who have some of the highest voter turnout in the country for immigrants. I mean, we're talking about 90% in some places, sometimes even much higher. Uh, the Cedar Riverside area has the highest early voting turnout in the state. Uh, That's so, remarkable and this, because and I would Minnesota not has take the all highest the credit. turnout in the country. Yeah. Yeah. So I would not take all that credit. I would say CARE is part of a larger group of community organizations that do that work. Uh, but we're really proud of that and we want to continue that, especially in rural Minnesota, which we have seen uh, a huge change in, in election. Uh, Real quick in about less than a minute, tell us what is your top priority at the Minnesota legislature? So obviously we're trying to push for policies that we've been pushing for a while. I think among those are obviously the police accountability bills that we're supporting with a large coalition. But actually our, our biggest priority now is education. The state of Minnesota has the worst achievement gap in the country. We're 50th. And I have been talking to educating leaders and talking about what are solutions and I'm, I'm sad, sad to share there isn't much. And so we're trying to now push legislation to support innovative community-based ways to address the human gap. Wow. There is a lot on your plate, Jaylani. Um, thank you so much for coming to our program today and talking a little bit about uh, this issue. We'd love to have you back on in the future because I think there's much more to be said. Jaylani Hussein, Executive Director, Council on American Islamic Relations, Minnesota. Thank, Thank you for being on Access to Democracy. Thank you for having me.